Hello, loved ones. It's good to be with you today. I first give thanks to the Holy Spirit, also known as Ruach, the very breath I breathe. I'm incredibly grateful to the Way leadership, Pastor Mike, Pastor Tanisha, Pastor Donna, Minister Lauren, and Minister Mike for the support and opportunity to share a word with you. Within this community, my family and I have been held, challenged, and loved wholly. I pray that God bless our The Way community so that we prosper even as our souls prosper, especially given that we are holding a lot in our homes and communities. Let's begin together. Turn with me to the lectionary passage, Luke the 24th chapter, verses 36 through 48. I'm reading from the New Standard Revised Version, which says, While they were talking about this, meaning Jesus arising from the dead, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do you doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. He said, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me and the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understanding the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Dear God, open our hearts and our minds and allow us to receive your word. Let your word fall on fertile ground. Allow it to grow accordingly. In your name, I pray. Amen. It is said that the author of the book of Luke, while not an original disciple, reflects in his writing a people belonging to the kingdom of God as fellow citizens. And he shows the God that can do the impossible. And God does through Jesus, who heals, restores, and resurrects. In this book, we see that Jesus is concerned with the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. How else? Do we account for Jesus' insistence on justice, on resistance, and on setting right the wrongs of the Roman Empire? Jesus heals and addresses the people's conditions that are induced by the empire. Things related to poverty, malnutrition, mental illness, and demon possession. He confirms this to an imprisoned John the Baptist by sending word to him through John's followers. In chapter 7, verse 22, Jesus says, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. Now, in our lectionary passage, we see that after Jesus is resurrected from a state-sanctioned death, he appears to several people in community. In the Luke account, we see that he meets up with some friends on the road to Emmaus. In community, the Emmaus men affirm what Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women have already testified. Jesus has indeed risen from the dead. The people are confounded even as Jesus appears during their conversation. Jesus offering peace proves to them that he's not a ghost by revealing his scars. He eats a piece of boiled fish, gives them words of wisdom, and then heads back to heaven on the cloud. I can imagine the belief and disbelief and bits of heartbreak and hope. There is hope for Jesus' return, 
But the community of believers are still staring up at the cloud while marveling and wondering about what's next. After all, Rome is still in power. I'm gripped too. So in this message, I engage the Holy Spirit and the text and privilege my lived experience as a marginalized person living in another empire. I ask that you do the same too. Your representation matters. This faith walk following Christ isn't something that happens outside of our experience. It is our experience. So let's open our minds to understand the scriptures as found in the book of Luke and explore the resurrection together. I call our exploration Resurrection's Call to Freedom. Resurrection's Call to Freedom. We often talk about the sin between us, within us, and among us. I'd like to shine light on the resurrection, offering the opportunity to remove the sin among us in community. Please know that I will make reference to empire and use it interchangeably with words like oppressor. Now, when I make reference to empire, I'm talking about the people, the systems, the ideologies, etc., that seek to supplant God, meaning those things that seek to hold us captive, even enslaved to it for its own sustenance. I have three call and response points to share as it relates to the liberating power of resurrection in community for the elimination of sin among us or committed against us. Number one, resurrection proves that what seeks to dominate us and take our very essence, like the empire and its systems, has no power. My friends, I believe Jesus shows up in the post-crucified body to prove the ultimate resurrection to his followers. Not only does death have no sting, but also the empire has no power. Look at what they did to me. And they still lose. If the empire, the oppressor, or the adversary has no power, then we cannot afford to play by their rules because then we lose. The late prophet Audre Lorde reminds us that we cannot dismantle the master's house using his tools because it never brings about genuine change. A fact that particularly threatens folks who still define the master's house as their only source of support. Unhooking from the master is Jesus all day. For example, the religious leaders who got financial perks from the empire followed money confront Jesus about taxation. Maybe we can catch him on some tax evasion. Jesus pulls a coin with Caesar's likeness on it out of a fish and says, render or give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God the things of God's. What is Christ saying? What the empire owns is empty and meaningless. Hand it right back to the emperor. Give him his LaCoin. The empire owns nothing anyway. The earth? It's the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, Psalm 24. God owns it all and gives to us immeasurably. Follow God. To see Jesus in his post-crucified body gives hope. We thought you were gone forever. No, I'm still here. I offer that hope concerning the resurrection is hardly about what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. No, through the power of resurrection, our faith moves us from doing good in spite of suffering to having hope while holding hard experiences in order to shift the world in which we live. As we see from the conversation between Jesus and the certain ruler, piety alone doesn't shift anything. In Luke 18, 18, a certain ruler approaches Jesus about how to gain eternal life. The ruler attests that he has kept all the commandments hooray for him. So Jesus invites him to dole out reparations, sell all you have and give to the poor. Did Jesus want him to be broke? No. 
He offered him a very practical way to shift extreme wealth to extreme poverty within community and beyond being a benefactor or grant maker. The ruler declines. The ruler has agency, but lacks an imagination. He's opted to keep the empire's dystopian belief in the haves and have nots. The shift happens when we do good and commit to turn away from the master's tools while holding the lived experience of harm done to ourselves and others, we are compelled to choose resistance to injustice and wrongdoing, choose reclamation of our faith, choose restoration of right relationships, and choose reimagining, as we say, the kingdom of God. Here's the call. If resurrection proves that what seeks to dominate us has no power, here's a response, then freedom is operating in our God-given divine agency to co-imagine and live into God's kingdom. If resurrection proves that what seeks to dominate us has no power, then freedom is operating in our God-given divine agency to co-imagine and live into God's kingdom. Number two. Resurrection is not passive. It's not a one-time occurrence. It's an ongoing call to action. Jesus does not proclaim suffering as the end to his earthly activity. He says that his purpose was for repentance and forgiveness of sins to be proclaimed in his name to all nations. We're not required to endure hardship for a reward in heaven. After all, we see the reward of simply giving. Jesus says, give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. Chapter 6, verse 38. We do not need suffering in order to get reward. Humbly building on Pastor Tanisha's decolonizing our Christian faith, we have to look at who handed us the suffering, passive, submissive Christ. Womanist theologian Dr. Joanne Marie Terrell points to the hermeneutics of sacrifice or the way in which we see sacrifice, which is the love minus justice ethic. This was a warped interpretation of being Christ-like that was instituted by U.S. slaveholders in order to keep enslaved people passive by loving the enemy or captor and setting sight on heaven the reward for suffering. Let's have a Sankofa moment. Enslaved Africans, several of whom were Christian upon arrival, rejected this sacrificial theology. They knew full well that the foundation of Christian faith guarantees freedom for the soul and body. Under the threat of physical violence, the oppressors handed us a submissive Christ and this love minus justice ethic or love without accountability. I wouldn't even call that love. And if we hold true to Christ's proclamation, this nation has an opportunity to repent for the sins it's committed against us. I can say with certainty that God wants justice later and now. Our salvation is for later and now. In light of other scripture, we see in the Gospel of John, the testimony of Jesus declaring that if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. So if resurrection is an ongoing call to action, then freedom is is love realized with injustice. If resurrection is an ongoing call to action, then freedom is love realized with injustice. And finally, number three, resurrection happens in community. Jesus is about empowering the people in community. Why else would he have sent the 12 and the 70 into community to heal, cast out demons, and hold authority over all the power of the enemy? Jesus tells them that as they are in community, nothing will hurt you, not even when stirring the fragility of the empire. 
The oppressor knows the power of community and is not about that life. Here are a few examples of the fragile empire. Chapter 11, verse 18. They kept looking for a way to kill Jesus, for they were afraid of him because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. Verse 32. They were afraid of the crowd, for all regarded John as truly a prophet. Chapter 22, verse 2. The religious leaders were looking for a way to put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. The resurrection gives power to the people. Who are the people? In the Luke text, we see Jesus deliberately flattening social hierarchy. For example, Jesus eats with folks who are on the margins for which he is labeled, and I quote, a glutton and drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. This happens to be a big deal because in the socio-political climate in which Jesus lives, the elite hold feasts to flaunt their wealth, prestige, and political authority. Instead, Jesus demonstrates community. But who are the people? They are the community in which God inhabits. They are diverse, disparate, vibrant, at odds, in harmony, neutral, seasonal, cacophonous, mellifluous, harmonious, biodynamic, biodiverse, intergenerational, transgenerational, and right now. Because the very nature of God is. We, the community, embody the first being last and the last being first. This, our community, powered by the resurrection, is not only about the express imago dei of God, but also about restoring dignity and flattening hierarchy, whereas those that seek to dominate and seek to disconnect us with shame from each other, ourselves, and ultimately our God, are not. Let's take a closer look at giving up your coat, which on the surface looks like acquiescence, but is more likely an act of dignity. Chapter six in the latter part of verse 29 reads, and from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Jesus's exhortation may actually be a nonviolent way of resistance while exposing the injustice of the oppressor. Biblical scholar Warren Carter offer some historical context for this hard saying. Jesus' statement concerns a court proceeding over economic inequalities. It probably involves a poor person who has provided a coat or outer garment as a pledge for a loan he cannot now repay and is about to lose his land. Giving up his shirt or inner garment means stripping himself naked in court. It symbolizes the stripping away of property and dignity. It exposes, among other things, the basic humanity of the poor, as well as the powerful person's heartless demand. So Jesus isn't saying, relent. Instead, in community, he's saying, expose the harm, get your dignity. But let's play like you did something. Jesus tells a whole parable of the prodigal son who is restored even after he messes over his inheritance. Did he suffer consequences? Yes. But unlike the oppressor who believes that the power of life and death belong in their hands, Jesus preserves the life of the prodigal son whose redemption was celebrated in community. Even after leaving the tomb, Jesus makes several appearances to loved ones in community and eats with them. He spends time with them, giving them hope and reassuring them about what's next. Friends, I believe that even in that act of resurrection, Jesus shows respect for us humans by acknowledging the scars. Jesus could have easily shown up to his loved ones in pristine condi condition with no marks on his body. Everyone he healed was made whole. Instead, he shows up with the scars. I don't believe that this was an object lesson to say, see, I get it. And I'm unconvinced that this was an experiment for God to be clothed in flesh. No, I count that as appropriation. But friends... We are literally made in God's image. 
The Hebrew prophets alone reflect the deep pathos of God. God feels all the feelings and knows us intimately. So I believe Jesus holding the proof of scars is out of respect for our pain and suffering and honors our dignity. God holds our lives sacred and priceless and does so in community. If resurrection happens in community, then freedom is our full humanity expressed and affirmed by community. If resurrection happens in community, then freedom is our full humanity expressed and affirmed by community. In closing, some of us are wearing scars. I have several, and yet God is showing me through Jesus a reimagined resurrection. I can count my losses, the losses of the communities to which I belong, and even the world's losses. I can look at the work of the oligarchy and feel consumed by a perceived inability to do very much. I can see the spiritual warfare and its manifestation of evil on this planet. Like many of us, my labor has been exploited by capital greed. It's a guttural hurt when you learn the value of your work is sorely undervalued. I've had to wrestle with something as simple as being taken seriously about my well-being and the well-being of my children only to be blamed for it and interrogated about a perceived decline. I've endured self-doubt, betrayal, and had my dignity stripped from me even when I was living right. I've witnessed empire-induced pain, suffering, and death in my family of origin and forged families because, well, that's the law or it is what it is. Still, I know who God says I am, sacred. Our whole entire lives are sacred. In our sacredness, we hold belief, disbelief, bits of heartbreak and hope. And Jesus shows up to say, peace be with you. Remember, if resurrection proves that what seeks to dominate us has no power, then freedom is operating in our God-given divine agency to co-imagine and live into God's kingdom. If resurrection is an ongoing call to action, then freedom is love realized within justice. And if resurrection happens in community, then freedom is our full humanity expressed and affirmed by community. It would appear that our community has been fragmented for at least the past year. Prior to then, we were trying to catch our breath in time to say hello to one another. However, those of us who participate in prayer, meditation, and worship know that the circle cannot be broken by any circumstance or dilemma. We understand when someone is dropped in our spirit and removed to pray for and or reach out to them. So with that, let us hold tight to each other, seeking God's truth together and respecting the presence of God we witness in each other. Let's hold tight to God, the Holy Spirit, who leads and guides us into all truth and truths and withholds no good thing from us. Jesus says to his loved ones, some of you will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God. Perhaps we too can live to see the day when, as Prophet Amos says, justice wells up like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. For we believe that Jesus fulfills the words of the prophets and the Psalms. I'm reminded of a hymn of a few words that I grew up singing during worship. I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. From the corners of the congregation, you might hear people intermittently cry, Woo! or yes, Lord, or hallelujah. We sang, everything's gonna be all right, along with the hook, be all right, be all right, be all right, until it showed up in our hand claps and got good to our feet. We let the Holy Spirit wash over us as we danced and shouted with our scars because we could see Christ lit up in all his glory with his scars, reminding us that all this right here that oppresses, passes away. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, 
both now and forever. Amen.